Hey Icon, Justin here. It's good to be back with you. Uh, it's been a couple weeks. Thanks to Josh uh, for all of his preaching effort that he has put in. Hopefully he can go back to bath time and The Bachelor and not stress himself out with sermons uh, for a couple weeks. Uh, but we are jumping back into John. Uh, so turn to John chapter 8. We're going to pick up right where uh, Josh left off last week. Uh, and as you're turning there, um, I want to talk a little bit about our topic today. So uh, this whole series has been called He's the One. And this week we're talking about He's the One with the Truth. Okay. And, and I, I'm not sure, at least in my lifetime, I don't think there's ever been a more kind of precarious moment to claim to have the truth, right? It seems like we're living in a time where there are a lot of truths out there. And in fact, there's quite a bit of skepticism about the idea of there being kind of a capital T truth at all, okay? So rather than getting kind of lost in like, well, what's the truth? And is, is, you know, is this the, is Christianity the truth? Is gospel the truth? And how does that compare to other truths? And kind of get, get lost in the meta level of this conversation. I, I want us to, to, to really focus on ourselves for a moment and the idea of just us telling the truth, okay? This was a, a lesson that I learned the hard way, right? So many years ago, uh, I was planting a church in San Francisco, and, and it was the four hardest years of my life. I was a mess, personally. I was dealing with loss and fear and all kinds of stuff, and that's a story for another time. But one of the things my counselor told me, kind of a mentor, counselor, pastor, friend of mine, uh, he, he told me, man, when you are telling your story, make sure you tell the worst version of it right? The, the unvarnished truth. Don't try to go, well, it was this, but it really wasn't this. It really wasn't that bad. It really wasn't this way. He goes, just tell the worst version of the story. And he goes, I promise you, you will experience a kind of freedom that you have never experienced before, right? That there's, that there's nothing that you go, well, I'm not going to tell this part, right? Because as long as there is a this part, there's always something you're hiding. And when you're hiding, it's exhausting. Okay. And, and man, he told me that, and I was terrified of that idea because there was a lot of ways in which I really messed up in San Francisco, like bad leadership and, and, and all, uh, allowing fear to drive me in so many different ways. But he encouraged me to so just keep telling the worst version of the story. And man, I tell you, every single time I did, I felt more and more and more freedom. And so th that was a, a huge lesson that I learned many years ago and have tried to apply over and over. And I don't always apply it as well as I hope and always experience that when I'm hiding something, it tears me up, okay? So when, when we're talking about the truth and Jesus talking about the truth here in this passage, don't, don't get into, don't let your mind wander into all the political and the ideological and all that. I want you to just think about you and the truth you have to tell. And I'm not talking about, oh, speak your truth kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's not what this is. This is about you telling the truth about who you are, telling the truth about what's going on in here and trusting Jesus enough to let him handle that unvarnished truth. Now that sounds terrifying probably to many of you. And I'm just telling you it is like, it's probably even scarier than you're thinking, right? So what I want to do is I want to get through this story and I want us to see why Jesus is the only one that can really handle our truth. Okay. So John chapter eight, starting in verse 12. Now, the story that Josh preached last week of the woman caught in adultery, one of the reasons why your Bible kind of sections it out and says, we're not sure if this was part of the earliest manuscripts is because it is kind of an interruption to the flow of John's gospel chronologically. Now, it's entirely possible that this moment happened right in between uh, the end of chapter seven and where we pick up in chapter eight, verse 12. But I want us to not lose the, the, the kind of the context of what's happening, right? So the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles that Josh talked about two weeks ago is still happening. This is the, the setting for where Jesus is. And that's where we jump in. So I want us to read chapter 8, verse 12, and then we'll stop for a second. 
It says this, again, Jesus spoke to them, right? So this is, again, like he spoke to them last time when, when they were pouring out the water and Jesus says, you know, spoke up, right? Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, this isn't Jesus walking through the streets and just saying to people, hey, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. Like he's got his followers around him and just going like, hey, by the way, guys, I'm the light of the world, right? Like that's not what's happening. They are in the middle of, in fact, at the tail end of this uh, feast of the booths and, and this, this very important moment at the end of the feast where they light up a bunch of candles or light up a bunch of torches, this is the moment Jesus stands up and proclaims to the crowd, I am the light of the world. So for context, uh, Kent Hughes, a Bible commentator and pastor, uh, describes it this way. He says, in the center of the treasury, and this is a part of the temple in Jerusalem, in the center of the treasury, four great torches were set up. Some accounts say that the torches were as high as the highest walls of the temple, and that at the top of these golden candelabra were great bowls holding 65 liters of oil. There was a ladder for each candelabra, and in the evening, young, healthy priests would carry the oil up to the top. I love that little detail, the young, healthy priests, because when I picture the priests, I picture old dudes who should not be carrying oil up ladders, right? Like, so I appreciate that little detail. These are the CrossFit priests, right? These are the yoke dudes who are like one arm, am wrapping this. Okay, the great flames that leapt out of these torches illumined the whole temple and much of Jerusalem. It was spectacular. The Mishnah describes what happened after the torches were lit, saying men of piety and good works used to dance before them with burning torches in their hands, singing songs and praises, and countless Levites played on harps, lyres, cymbals, and trumpets and instruments of music. So this is like the culmination of the festival. This is like the lighting of the Olympic torch, right? Like the, the flames go up. They said it lights up most of Jerusalem. And it's at this moment that Jesus yells above the crowd, I am the light of the world. That's the symbolism here. That, that's what's happening. Now, as Josh has already told us, the, the Feast of Booths is about God's care for the Jews while they were wandering in the desert. Right? So right as they left Egypt and they were freed from slavery, God led them with a pillar of smoke that had fire in the midst of it. So it was a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke during the day. In fact, in Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22, it describes it. It says, The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay, so that's all the symbolism. That's what's happening in this moment. So they light up these torches. Everybody cheers. And they go, yeah, we remember when God led us out of slavery through the wilderness. And we followed the pillar of fire. And that's what we're celebrating in this moment. And that's also the moment Jesus goes, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, right? So Jesus' claim is, if you will follow me, I will guide you through life the way the pillar of fire guided the Israelites through the wilderness, right? This is the, this is the claim that Jesus is making in this moment. Amen. I don't know about you, but I spend a good portion of my life looking for guides, looking for help, looking for mentors, looking for coaches. Whenever I come up with a, a, a new obstacle or a new problem, I immediately reach out. I, you know the, the old like uh, guys don't like to stop and ask for directions thing? That's not me. I'm all about asking for directions because I don't want to waste time being lost. So I am happy to ask for directions. In fact, you know where I should go because I'd love any help you have, right? I have always had mentors. I have always had coaches. I have always had people in my life that I'm reaching out to going, help me. I don't know. I don't know what to do next. Here's a problem I don't know how to solve or I've never come up to before. Will you help me, right? Um, when, when we were kids, we used to play this game where we would set up an obstacle course 
in our house, like in a living room, dining room, that, whatever part of the house, right? And we'd set up the obstacle course and then blindfold each other, right? And, and one person had to guide the other person through the obstacle course blinded, right? And you know, the, like any good older brother, occasionally, maybe my directions would lead them over a coffee table. It's hard to remember, right? But this was, this was the game. One person's blindfolded, kind of trying to make it through this obstacle course, and the other person is guiding them along the way, going, okay, one step to your left. That was to my right. This sounds bad at this. It was very bad. Uh, you know, go to the left, a little, you know, two steps forward, now to the right. Like, they had to guide them through, and it was like this trust game. Right, and occasionally we'd play it where you got to do the obstacle course without a blindfold, and then you put the blindfold on and had to do it from memory, right? And just kind of make your way through the obstacle course blindfolded. Super fun game. We were very poor. That was that. That was that. That was our games. Like the coffee table was our toy. Anyway, the point is, when I was reading about this and the claim of Jesus, the promise of Jesus to be our light, that whoever follows Him will not walk in darkness but have the light of life, it reminded me of that game. It reminded me of most of my life that I'm constantly asking other people, will you help guide me? Because I'm walking in darkness here and I don't know where to go. Now, I don't know if there has been a more difficult, confusing, complicated time to be a Christian in the world right? Like there, there's a lot going on, a lot to navigate, a lot of new questions being asked that we've never as a human species had to answer before. There, there is a lot of complexity. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of conflicting truths. I don't know if there has ever been a more difficult time. There are many people vying for our allegiance or for us to believe their truths. Worldviews and reality itself is being shaped and reshaped by everything from politics to media to pop culture to insane conspiracy theories like QAnon that are trying to like literally reshape reality. And we're trying to navigate that in a really, really difficult time. And this is the blessed simplicity of Jesus's claim. He simply says, follow me and I will show you where to go follow me and you will never walk in darkness again. Just follow me and you will not, you you will have the light before you. You will know where to go, when to go left and when to go right. You will not have an unreliable older brother who makes you trip over coffee tables on purpose. If you just follow me, you'll be okay. There's a, there's a simplicity to that. Right? Like we, we like to make things complicated and hard and, 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 and kind of woo-woo sometimes. And Jesus just goes, just follow me. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Um, later in the, the story of the Jews and the pillar uh, in Numbers chapter 9, verse 15 to 23. I love this passage says this, on the day that the tabernacle was set up, right? So the tabernacle was kind of the, the traveling temple, right? So on the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle. This is the pillar, uh, the pillar of, uh, of smoke er, and, and cloud. Covered the tabernacle, the tent of te- the testimony. And at evening, it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always. The cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after that, the people of Israel set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out. And at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle many days, the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. And if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time, that the cloud continued over the tabernacle, abiding there, the people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped, and at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. I love that. I love that passage because just over and over, it just says the same thing. 
So when the, when the cloud was on the tabernacle, they stayed. And then when it moved, they moved. And sometimes it was a day and they stayed for a day. Sometimes it was a week and they stayed for a week. Sometimes it was a month. Guess what they did? They stayed for a month. Like there's just, a, it's just simple. The cloud was, I mean, how awesome would that be if life were that easy, right? We wake up in the morning and go look out at the outside of our house. That cloud's still here. We're good. I mean, it's Seattle, so there's always a cloud, so we'd never leave, right? Like, this is kind of what would happen. But, like, the simplicity of, like, oh, the cloud moved. I guess it's time to go. Pack up kids. kids. Like, we got to go. God's moving, and so we got to move with him, right? And, and it, like, I love the simplicity of that, and I love the faithfulness of Israel to simply go, it doesn't matter. If, if God's here, we're here. If God moves on, we move on. It's, it's that simple. There, there is something so desirable to me about that, right? It's, it's not easy because I, I, I'm positive there were times where God stopped in like bad neighborhoods. And they're like, oh, uh, uh, God, can we keep moving maybe? Like maybe just a day or two here. And, and he stayed for a month. And there was no doubt that sometimes God stopped in really nice areas with like slow moving rivers and nice views and like free coffee. And they're like, hey, we could hang here for a bit. And God's like, nope, two days and we out, right? But when God stayed, they stayed. When God moved, they moved. That's it. So don't wait till you're confused and lost and in trouble to go to Jesus. Don't wait till it's too dark to see to go to Jesus. Wake up every morning and check the cloud. Wake up every morning and ask, where is Jesus? Is he stopping or is he going? Is he going left or right, forward or backward, into pain or into pleasure? Whatever it is, let's go, right? Now, one last thing on this. In, in Revelation 22, verse 5, there's this little verse that's always been kind of confusing to me, um, but one of the commentators that I uh, read this week kind of made, made mention of this verse, and it like makes so much, sense, so much sense in light of this verse. In Revelation 22, 5, it says that in heaven, there will be no light. There'll be no sun, no stars. There'll be no need of light because all the light we need comes from the presence of God, right? And I've always looked at that and like, is he just shining? Like, how do we see him? That seems really bright. Like, what if he goes inside? Like, I, you know, there's a lot, I got a lot of questions. But the, the idea here in Revelation 22, 5, that the only light we need is God, connected to Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, to me is an invitation into the presence of God. That the more and more and more you get into the presence of God, the nearer you come to God, the less external light you need, the more clarity you have because the light is revealed by God. Right? Right? Like the, the, the Israelites didn't need directions. They didn't need help. They didn't need a map. They didn't need anything. They had God. They were in the very presence of God in the form of the cloud and the fire. It was simple. They didn't need anything else external. They just had God. So for us, my, my hope, my prayer, I think the invitation here is just to wake up every morning and go, where's Jesus? Let's go. What, what's he doing? Where's he going? What's he, what's he asking of me? Let's go. And of course, it's not as simple as a cloud and a pillar of fire. I get that. But if we pursue the presence of God in our lives, the truth of God becomes very clear to us more and more and more. We don't need external sources. We just follow him. Okay. So that's the first idea. That the truth of God uh, is, is a light to our path, that it, it will light our way. The second is this. I want, you, I want to skip to verse 21, and I want to skip verses 13 to 20, mostly because it's the Pharisees arguing a point with Jesus that they already argued a couple chapters ago. So instead of entering into their argument again, we're just going to skip it and just go, Pharisees love to argue with Jesus, and, and they're doing it again. Skip to verse 21. So he said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, this all sounds very dark, right? Um, I, I was on Facebook uh, the other day, don't recommend it. 
And uh, I, I saw a, an interaction between a pastor friend of mine and, and some uh, girl who was posting on his page, like posting a comment. And, and, and he was posting about something about Jesus and the gospel and those kinds of things. And, um, this is, she, she, uh, she was pushing back on him in a way uh, that, that was, I, I, I thought, not fair exactly. Um, and, and was basically saying like, yeah, this, you know, Jesus and the church are like, they, they don't actually love people. And it sounds really, they're, they're really judgmental and all these things. And, and this is what she said. I want to read it for you, actually. She said this that the, basically the message of Christianity is do what I say and you, or you will burn. If your family and friends don't believe in me, I will burn them. I think that just about sums it up without going into too much detail, weeping and gnashing and teeth, gnashing of teeth and all go and sin no more. Be perfect as my father is perfect. People tend to feel pretty guilty when they are expected to meet impossible standards, right? This was her uh, sense of what Christianity was all about. Right. And my, my pastor friend engaged her really well and did a great job and loved her and, and kind of pushed back on some of those ideas. But I, this is a fairly common understanding, right? That the idea of the gospel is do these things, believe in me, you know, live up to this impossible standard, or as she says, I will burn you. Right. But, but the reality is that's, it's not even close to what, what Jesus is actually talking about. It's not even close to what the actual gospel is saying. In fact, this is a, a great example of a, a better representation of what the gospel invitation actually is, right? So Jesus is talking to these religious guys and says to them, I'm going away, you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. Now that sounds tough, right? Like that sounds really hard. I'm leaving. You're going to come after me. You're going to seek me, but you won't be able to find me and you're going to die in your sin, right? I mean, she's got a point at this point, okay? Go to 22. Jesus says, you're from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, this is where she, this, this smart, well-meaning girl, and many, many, many others gets this wrong idea about kind of what, what the interaction is or what the stakes are, okay? Jesus says to them, you, unless you believe I am who I am, you're just going to die in your sin. Okay. To which we might reply like, well, that just seems crazy unfair. Like we just got to make, we have to believe in you or else we're, we're going to die and go to hell and all this stuff. And the answer is uh, kind of yes, but it makes perfect sense. Okay. So I'm going to give you two illustrations here and, and, and hopefully try to make some sense of this. First, if, if somebody comes to you and says, Hey, I've got food. Will you take it? We have a choice to make, right? We can, we can uh, not take that food and remain hungry, okay? So if I came to you and said, hey, I've got food for you, and if you eat it, you won't be hungry anymore, but you gotta take the food, and you say, no, I'm not gonna take that food, and you remain hungry, would it then make sense to, for you to curse me for offering you food that you didn't take? It would not, right? You, you've made a choice to remain hungry instead of eating the food that I offered to you, okay? Second illustration. A doctor tells you that you have cancer and that he can provide the remedy for your cancer. You can accept his help or you can choose not to. But if you choose not to and you remain in your cancer and die, is that the doctor's fault? No. I mean, you, you'd be hard pressed to convince anybody that it's the doctor's fault who tells you, hey, you're sick and you're going to die. Or uh, someone saying, you're hungry and if you don't eat, you're going to die. Now, you can turn down those offers and, and play out the consequences of your decision and you have every right to do so. But that doesn't mean that the consequences of those decisions are not your consequences. It doesn't mean that they are the consequences of the doctor or the person who offers food, right? So the question is, in those moments, the question is, is the offer true? Is the offer of food or is the offer of remedy, is it true? Am I, first of all, am I actually hungry or, or, or do I actually need food? 
or am I actually cancerous, right? Like, do I actually have cancer? That's the first, that's the first kind of question we have to answer. When someone comes to you with a solution, we have to first say, do I actually have that problem? But then the second question we have to answer is, will that food or that doctor's remedy actually solve my problem, right? And so when Jesus comes to us, when he comes to the Jews here in the story, but when he comes to us and when he comes to this girl, he's simply saying, I think that if you don't have food, you're going to die. And so I want to give you food. Or I think that you have cancer, and if you don't treat it, you're going to die, and I have the treatment. Okay? Now, by all means, we have the opportunity to go, no, I think you're wrong, and I'm going to go do my own thing, to which Jesus goes, okay. That just plays out like the end, whatever is true is going to play out. If, if you actually need food and you reject food, you're going to die. If you are actually cancerous and you reject my help as a doctor, you're going to die of cancer. That's all Jesus is saying here. He goes, if you would just believe that I am he, I am the one that I say that I am. I've been telling you now for eight chapters that I come from God, that God the Father is my Father, that, he was, that I was sent from him, that I am the Messiah, that if you just believe in me, I can be the light that gives you life. I can save you from your sin. That's all you got to do. All you got to do is accept the offer of food. All you got to do is accept the offer of a remedy to your cancer. That's it. And if you turn it down, that's not my fault. That's yours. You're choosing to remain in your current state. How, how is that the doctor's fault? In verse 23, Jesus kind of ups the ante a little bit, right? Like the, the, the Jews are looking at him going like, who is this guy, right? Like he, he's, he's kind of talking in ways that are a little bit confusing at times or a little opaque. And, and they ask him like, who are you? And Jesus ups the ante in a really significant way going, I'm fundamentally different than you are right? This is not, we're not peers in this thing, right? In fact, D.A. Carson, who's a theologian, Bible commentator, sees four major differences here that Jesus kind of sets out for us. He says this, the themes developed in verses 12 through 20 are enlarged upon through the rest of this chapter. They include where Jesus comes from, where he is going, who the father is, and who Jesus is. Further, the opposite of these themes is applied to the Jews. Jesus is from above, the Jews are from below. They are from this world. He is not from this world. Where he goes, they cannot come. God is his father. Their father is the devil, right? We'll get to that here in a moment. So Jesus is kind of going, listen, it's not just that I'm like a guy trying to give you some advice and then go, when I say I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but walk in the light of life. That's not me going like, hey guys, I found a map. Like, come, like, let's go use this thing. He's going, like, I am fundamentally different. I, I don't just know the truth. I'm not just the one guide with the eyes open who can help the kid walk through the obstacle course. He goes, I designed it all. I am the truth. I don't just know the truth. I am the truth. I am the light that gives life. I'm not just holding a light like many of you, these little flashlights. He goes, I am the light that as you grow nearer to me, I am all that you need. So much so that one day there will be no sun or moon or stars because y'all will be in my presence and that's all you're, you're going to need. In John 1, right at the very beginning of this whole book, John starts by saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus goes, I, I'm just offering you what I have. All you got to do is take me at my word, that I am who I say I am, who, I, who I've been saying I am since the very beginning, that I was sent by God to save you. That's it. Now, you may say, I, I, I'm not cancerous. I, I, I don't have this sin problem that's going to send me to my death. Okay. All right. But if you change your mind, I've got the remedy for the disease you don't think you have. Skip to verse 28. Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, 
and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. And as he was saying these things, many believed in him. The core argument that the Pharisees keep having with Jesus is, is about authority. Like, who's, by whose authority do you say these things? By whose authority do you do these things? By whose authority do you heal on the Sabbath, right, for instance? And over and over and over, he said, I, I don't do anything except for what the Father tells me to do. That's it. I'm, I'm completely submitted to the will of the Father. I am on God's mission. I'm not doing my own thing. I'm not trying to be somebody. I am trying to fulfill the work of God for you. And then he says this in verse 28 again. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority. That phrase lifted up always in John means the cross. Oh, oh, it's just that's always what it means. So listen to what Jesus is saying. He goes, there's going to come a time where you're going to realize what's going on here. When you put me on that cross, you're going to realize I'm not here trying to build my own thing. You're going to realize that I am fully submitted to the Father, that I am not here on my own authority, that I only do whatever pleases the Father, that I only do whatever pleases God, whatever is in line with His will. That's what I do. You're going to know it when I'm on the cross because there's no way somebody walks to the cross on purpose, of their own will, of their own desire. That's never a thing. It's either the will of the government to condemn you to the cross, or in my case, in my case alone, the will of God to save you who are telling me that you don't need saving. And so that, that's the moment when you're going to know, right? This, this, is the, this is the ultimate difference between Jesus and everybody else. That not only is he from God, but he is fully submitted to God and on God's mission. It's this difference that allows Jesus to save us from our sins. He has to be different. And, and not just by a little bit. Denying Christ for, for most people isn't usually about Jesus at all. It's about, it's about the whole system. It's about having to admit the truth, about telling the worst version of your story, saying, I am deeply in need, like I have cancer and it's in every cell and I am in deep need. Typically, that's the stumbling block for people. It's not so much about Jesus. They, they generally like Jesus, but it's like what that means. What do I have to, what I have to admit? What, what goes along with that that becomes the stumbling block? But for the Jews, it was about Jesus. Not for us normally. We like Jesus, but for the Jews, it was about Jesus. Because Jesus is talking about a whole nother thing here. And it confronts the whole Jewish system that they had built. It confronts all of their power structures, all of their authority, all of the ways in which they do things, all of the language, all of the rules, all of the ways in which they have kept things together. It blows all that up. And so we can look at the Jews and go, yeah, it's just a power struggle. They didn't want to give up power and authority. And so we might want to think that that's different for us. But I wonder if it actually is. I wonder if it actually is. I wonder if for that girl, the problem actually is that she would have to admit, like, I can't hold this thing together. I am not in charge. I don't have the authority. I don't have the power. And I got to relinquish all that because part of this whole idea of Jesus and the gospel is to admit that I'm a sinner in deep need. I have cancer and it's all the way in every cell and I need a remedy that I can't. So the, the truth of Jesus uh, lights our way. It saves us from our sins. It, it blows up our world and, and challenges us to, 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 to have to tell that worst version of our own story and own our deep need in ways that we don't want to do. Number three, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews, who had believed in him. Sorry, let, re, read real quick at the end of 30. So Jesus has this interaction with the Pharisees. And verse 30 says, as he was saying these things, many believed in him. 
right? So remember, he's still, the, the, the Feast of Booze is happening. People are probably starting to party. He stands up, yells, I'm the light of the world. Immediately, the Pharisees are on him going like, hey, don't ruin our party. And why are you saying this? I'm going to argue with you. While he's talking to them, the other people in the crowd, this is a crowded temple, people start believing in him. Right, so in this moment, he turns his attention from the Pharisees and says to the Jews who had believed in him, verse 31, hey, y'all, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So whatever, whatever it was, whatever he said, like spurred faith in them. They believed in him in, in the midst of this argument with the Pharisees. People believed and he immediately does discipleship, right? He, he's not here to fight the Pharisees. That's, the, that, that, that's a distraction to his mission. So the moment people start believing, he turns his attention to them and goes, listen, hey, y'all, if you abide in me, abide, stay don't don't just believe and walk away but stay in me come nearer to me be in my presence more and more and more and more just like we talked about with the light if you can just be with me abide with me you are truly my disciples and if you do that he says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free i don't know if there is a more powerful sentence ever written or spoken in history than that line because man that that's a that's a challenge that's an opportunity that is a declaration of power that jesus goes if you just come near me if you just stick with me if you just abide with me and be in my presence live in my presence you're going to know the truth and i'm telling you that the truth will set you free will set you free. The Pharisees don't respond super well to that. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? You notice what, what they're responding to. Jesus goes, I can set you free. And that offends them. They get offended by that. Their identity is offended. They go, well, how dare you say we need to be freed? We've never been enslaved. Now, which they're just bad at history right? Like the whole Old Testament is them being enslaved, whether it's a Babylon or Egypt or whatever. I mean, they're basically enslaved to Rome at this very moment. So there's some like serious cognitive dissonance happening here where they go, we're not enslaved. We've never been enslaved, right? Like they're, they're not dealing with reality here. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, and this is, this is great. See, if it were me, I'd have, get, I'd have gotten in a fight with them about history and been like, you're dumb. You've been enslaved a bunch of times. Why would you say that? Jesus doesn't get sucked into their foolishness. He just says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you, and you do what you have heard from your father. So Jesus talks about freedom. They get offended. Say, we've never been enslaved. Jesus goes, if you sin, you're a slave to sin. Now you may think, no, I'm not. I would say, okay, then stop. Slavery is, is being controlled by something outside of yourself, being owned by something outside of yourself. So if you're not enslaved to sin, you should be in control of it. So stop. You can't. The reality is like, even if you're not a Christian, you, you have shaped some sort of kind of moral world and said like, this is what I think is right and this is what I think is wrong. And, and maybe entirely of your making, and you still can't live up to it. You can't even live up to a moral system that you created. You fail yourself all the time, don't you? You think it's, you think it's wrong to lie, and you lie. You think it's wrong to be arrogant, and you're arrogant. You think it's wrong to speak harshly to people, and you speak harshly. I mean, it's on and on and on. We cannot even abide by our own self-made laws. 
So yeah, I don't think it's a real hard argument that Jesus makes here to say when we sin, we are enslaved to sin, right? That, that's that's Jesus' argument here, and the opportunity is that we can be free from that, right? We can be free from that. And you can go back to the last section. That Really, the, the hard thing that we have to face is exactly what the Jews are facing here. Like we have to admit to a whole system of incompetence, a whole system of sin, a whole, a whole desperate need in our life. We can't do it. So we reject Jesus because he's telling us things we don't want to hear. Jesus says, the truth is that you're a slave to sin and it will kill you. The solution then is not to lead a coup yourself or discipline your way out of it. The solution is simply to believe that he is him. He's the one. Just like he said, if you will just believe that I am he. Now, these are little clues that in a couple weeks we're going to see how it all comes together. That Jesus has given them little clues about who he is. Referencing, making an Old, Te- Old Testament reference that they haven't picked up on. They're going to pick up on it at the end of chapter 8. We're going to look at that in a couple of weeks where it kind of all comes together and you realize the light bulb goes on because then they try to kill him, right? Like that's how, they, that's how you know <laughs> that somebody doesn't like you. Uh, and so uh, he's dropping these little hints here going like, if you just knew, if you just believed that I'm, I'm the one, I, I'm the one you've been looking for, Jews especially, looking for the Messiah for generations. If you just believed I was he, it would set you free. Verse 24, he says, I am he. Verse 28, again, you will know that I am he when I am lifted up. You'll see that I'm the one who could actually save you from your sins. We spend our whole lives trying to figure this thing out. Figure out what it means to live a life of flourishing, a life of joy, a life of peace. Jesus already told you the answer. If you believe in him, you will find out he was right the whole time. That's how it works. If you could just admit the fact that you have great need, you got cancer everywhere and you need a doctor. And he goes, I got the solution. I've got the remedy. If you can just come to grips with the fact that you, you, you're as sick as I say you are, you, you can be healed and you can be saved, right? I know this sounds like bad news, but here's the thing. It's worse news to be dying of cancer and not know it than to admit that you are dying of cancer and pursue a solution pursue a remedy and that's what jesus offers the truth of jesus is that you are a slave to sin and he made a way for you to be free and that you will be free indeed he says that that's the the promise of this is that you can be free the only way to be truly free from sin is to admit that you have sinned otherwise you're hiding and you're pretending, and man, that's slavery. That's slavery. That's exhausting. It, it, it's a never-ending battle to keep the truth hidden, the truth that you know but don't want anyone else to know, even though they all know it too. That's the fight. And this is what Jesus is inviting us into. Come into the light. If you come into the light, you follow me, You'll never walk in darkness again. You'll see the light. You'll walk by the light. And I know it's bright and I know it feels vulnerable, but guess what? The light of Jesus is not just bright, it's also warm. And that's what you find. That yes, it's, it's exposing and yes, it's vulnerable, but at the end of the day, you are loved in a way you had never known possible. Last week, Josh talked about the mercy of God and that's what you experience immediately. The mercy of God. That when he looks down on you naked and exposed in all of your sin and in all of your need, he has nothing but love, nothing but mercy, nothing but grace. And we know it because he went to the cross to make the way. That's the proof. When Jesus says, you'll know who I am when I go to the cross, that's how we know. That's how we know that he's full of mercy and he's full of grace and that he loves us. And that all we got to do is admit that we need what he did. We need the cross. And we have it. Jesus is the one with the truth. Jesus is the truth. Let him tell the truth about who you are and embrace it. Because when we do, 
He'll tell us who we are. Deeply, deeply loved sons and daughters running back to the embrace of the Father. Let's pray. Jesus, you are uh, a, a good, good Father. You are uh, the, the one who has made a way for us to be known, for us to be healed, for us to walk in the light, to be exposed in a way that doesn't uh, bring fear, but brings intimacy. That's the promise. So God, I, I pray that you would allow us to overcome our fear, that you would give us faith, that we could believe, Lord, that we are indeed dying and in need of the remedy you provide. May we look to the cross and see exactly who you are. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, as we always do, we're going to transition to a time of response, and we'll do this in a few different ways. Um, we'll take communion together, so I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, to grab your communion supplies. Um, we'll uh, give our offering, uh, and so again, want to encourage you to continue to walk in generosity. Uh, we have such a generous church, and I'm super thankful for you all. Um, we're going to sing together and sing the praises of the God who made a way for us. But before we do any of that, we're going to take some time in silent reflection and prayer. And this is a great moment uh, for us to talk to God honestly about what's in us. He knows. It's not a surprise to him, right? Like he knows it all, and he still makes this offer. He knows you have cancer, and he's coming to you because of that. So don't hide. There's no reason to hide. He knows it all, and all he has is love and grace and mercy for you. So let's take some time to really... Think about that and pray about that together.